In the 20th century, Kansas City produced two uniquely American geniuses who would both forever alter the physical and cultural landscape of the country. One of these men built a magic kingdom, a fantasy world that offered non-stop, wholesome family fun and a complete escape from reality. The other one moved to Hollywood and opened a theme park. Tanner Colby, in his book, Some of My Best Friends Are Black, The Strange Story of Integration in America. I'm Nathaniel Bozarth, and this is Dividing Lines, a tour of the history of segregation in Kansas City, primarily through its real estate. Maybe you're here in Kansas City, sitting at a desk or perched on your couch, or maybe you're somewhere else, curious about how the history of a Midwestern city relates to where you live. Wherever you are, I am honored to be your guide on this tour, and I can assure you that the story I'll tell has plenty to do with your city. Several of the real estate practices that we'll talk about were perfected here in Kansas City and used throughout the country. In other cases, Kansas City's story offers a representative example of good business practiced nationwide. In order to give you a more immersive experience, we've filmed this as a 360 degree video. That means that even though we'll always be driving forward, you can change the direction you're looking. If you're on a computer, you can follow me now by clicking and dragging on the video with your mouse. If you're on a phone or tablet, you can simply swipe with your finger or just turn the, the device in the direction you wanna look. And if you're on a virtual reality headset, all you have to do is turn your head. I'd recommend sitting in a swivel chair, if that's the case. Throughout the tour, you'll see graphics overlaid on present day Kansas City, as well as archival photography and documents. When there's a lot of extra material that is related to, but not directly connected to our story, We'll put it at the back behind you and notify you like this. It'll be up to you if you want to turn around to learn more or just take in the visual landscape. This is Shawnee Mission East High School. We're starting here because if you ask any middle class family with kids about why they moved to their current neighborhood, they'll probably say that it had something to do with proximity to good schools. So much of how our cities look is the consequence of these seemingly individual family decisions. You're gonna hear from a lot of people throughout the tour. To start with, here's Lauren Cole, a 2017 graduate of Shawnee Mission East. Shawnee Mission East, which is fed into from Mission Hills, Kansas which is, you know, one of the most expensive zip codes in Kansas. And uh, there's a lot of things going on uh, in the hallways and in like a high school experience that I wouldn't say were necessarily bad, but also like there isn't a lot of change between person to person. And a lot of people have the same experiences growing up, you know, hitting country clubs in the summer awesome vacations, driving nice cars. And um, once you get beyond that in Shine Mission East and like uh, delve into like our teachers and stuff, we've got like incredible teachers, a lot of incredible teachers that like are really open in not only their fields, but want to expand kids' minds in every way. So in many ways, it's the ideal American high school experience exactly what parents intended for their kids when they moved to this well-funded, affluent school district. When I was talking to Lauren, she mentioned that at this school, you might be in class next to, next to someone whose last name is on a skyscraper downtown. Here's Lauren again. As she talks, we'll get driving. Like, definitely, look around right before you leave, see all the nice cars in the parking lot. Understand like, you know, we, we had to expand parking lots because 
our school didn't have enough parking spaces because everyone singularly drove a car to school. As we exit the school's parking lots on parking lots, look to your left at some of the elegant Prairie Village homes. Get used to the feeling of the 360 degree video on your device. I'll start talking again in a few blocks. Throughout this virtual tour, we'll stop at traffic lights here and there. I encourage you to take these moments of pause to think and reflect. How do these places we talk about relate to where you grew up? Or where you live now? We're driving through the city of Prairie Village. The entire city was developed in the late 1940s by J.C. Nichols. He was a prolific real estate developer in the first part of the 20th century. He was one of the two men mentioned in that quote I read you at the start of our tour. As a real estate developer, Nichols would basically buy a plot of land and build houses with the intention of selling all those houses. In the case of Prairie Village, there were no pre-orders and no guaranteed return on investment. It was a risk, but it paid off for Nichols. This area was mostly farmland before Nichols and others like him developed it into these lovely suburban neighborhoods. Patience and 42, patience and 42, patience and 42. The large, overhanging trees stand from times predating the houses built around them. Well-kept houses, large, meticulously manicured lawns. Here's Mia Rios, one of Lauren's classmates from Shawnee Mission East, sharing her thoughts. If you look around the houses here in our neighborhood, in the Prairie Village area, the houses not only are bigger themselves, but they're more spacious in between each house. The landscaping is definitely more vibrant and uh, more detailed prone, I feel like. Over here, like you can't keep a bag of trash on the curb without like marking it so they can pick it up. Or like there's certain things that you can't keep on the front yard because you'll get in trouble for it or like fined for it. That's fined by your homeowners association. Since their initial construction, no one has been able to buy one of these homes without joining. J.C. Nichols understood the power of communities acting together, of peer pressure, in a way. Well-kept properties get better valuations, which generate more property taxes, which fund the schools. Look around. This is what can happen when a group of people decide to protect their property value. For most residents, 
these policies paid off. After all, it's been common knowledge for nearly a century that a good home is a great way to build wealth. But that notion wasn't always so common. The real estate industry invented it. They distributed pamphlets and took out ads in the paper to convince potential buyers and later lawmakers that a home was more than a place to live. It was an investment in one's future. And all in all, it worked. All these suburban homes have built a lot of wealth for the developers who built them, for the realtors who sold them, and for the residents who bought them. Soldiers returning from World War II benefited from mortgages that were subsidized by the GI Bill. The subsidy allowed new homeowners to make a down payment that was a mere fraction of the value of the home and benefit from mortgage financing with a low interest rate. Without that subsidy, they couldn't have afforded to buy these homes, protect the value, and to build that wealth. J.C. Nichols built Prairie Village so that the GI Bill veterans could use their subsidy on his houses. We're now in a different city, Mission Hills. This is another of J.C. Nichols' developments, but from the 1920s. As Lauren mentioned earlier, this is one of the most expensive zip codes you can find. Prairie Village and Mission Hills are both beautiful. I mean, just look at how perfect they look. Yet both Prairie Village and Mission Hills share a common discriminatory foundation. Let me put it this way. Today, Prairie Village where we were just driving, is 95% white. But that's not how it was intended to be. It was intended to be 100% white. By the time J.C. Nichols planned both Mission Hills and Prairie Village, it was best practice to bake what were called racially restrictive housing covenants into the deeds of your homes so that your neighborhoods would be, quote, racially homogeneous. But J.C. Nichols took this best practice one step further. He made his covenants self-renewing through bulletproof legalese written into those mandatory homeowners associations I told you about. They were self-renewing and enforceable. Not only did owners have to sell to a white buyer, they had to copy and paste the same racially restrictive covenant into the new buyer's deed. If they didn't, the homeowners association could sue the would-be seller and seize the property. J.C. Nichols' restrictive covenants with their innovative mix of legal logic and peer pressure set the new standard for what racially restrictive covenants could be. J.C. Nichols called it planning for permanence, and to other developers, it became just good business. So look around at this idyllic pocket of residential bliss. The lawns aren't the only thing that have been meticulously manicured. I want to introduce you to someone I really admire. Sidney Willens. Sid was an attorney and public figure in Kansas City. He's going to tell his story, which will illustrate some of the history we'll be talking about throughout the tour. My introduction to this whole issue took place when I received a phone call at my law office in the Commerce Building from Harold Klopper. Harold Klopper is a licensed real estate broker. He said, do you have any kind of line of credit? I would like to buy a house on Benton Boulevard somewhere. And he said, I need $10,000. He says, and you will have $1,500 profit in 90 days. And I said, what? What are you talking about? If it doesn't smell good to me, then it doesn't smell good. But Harold's integrity and, and so I said, yeah, I have a $10,000 line of credit at the Mercantile Bank and uh, I'll go. and." And he says, you want to go look at the house? No, I implicit, I trust you. I'll go and I call Bill Orm at the bank at uh, Mercantile. Bill, I need to get this money. 
And I did, and I took it out to Harold, and he bought the house for $5,000. He improved it, repaired it, and he ended up sending me in within 60 days $1,500. That's pretty good interest on your money. You just crossed into Missouri. Before we go too far, let me recap Sid's story. Sid had put up $10,000 to flip this property, with his trusted friend Harold Klopper managing the funds and development. Within 60 days, Sid had made his $10,000 back and made a $1,500 profit. That's a 15% profit in less than two months. Sid never went to see the house, never knew who was selling the house, nor to whom it was being sold. It was just business. Here's Ward Parkway. As we drive, remember that this is a 360 video and that you can change the direction you're looking. Also, feel free to pause or rewind the video if needed. Beautiful, isn't it? Ward Parkway. This six and a half mile boulevard is accented by fountains, ponds, and statuary. Showing off this ritzy boulevard is a mainstay for KC residents when they have visitors in town. At the end of the 19th century, a handful of Kansas City's social elites decided to educate citizens on the importance of thoughtful urban planning, what would eventually be called zoning. These influencers wanted to build urban and suburban parks connected by a system of boulevards. This philosophy and aesthetic became a part of the City Beautiful movement, which quickly spread across the United States. Real estate developers were quick to join the movement. They found that beautiful parks and boulevards increased the value of their developments. By the 1920s, J.C. Nichols was working with these urban planners as he developed the Country Club Plaza to the south of the city's limits. We'll come up on the plaza in a moment. Ward Parkway was designed as a focal point of what he called the Country Club District. The homes you see standing majestically along the parkway were integral to Nichols' plan of selling all the other houses behind them. In essence, Ward Parkway acted as a price bump. Every city and suburb has features like Ward Parkway. Extra amenities that boost property value, that boost demand, parks, boulevards, pools, shopping districts. But every time someone thinks about these amenities and how they make their neighborhood better, they imply that some other place is worse.
We're just entering the Country Club Plaza. It was the first shopping mall intended for folks to arrive by automobile. It was built as an added amenity for the residents of the Country Club District. J.C. Nichols created this first shopping mall, outdoor shopping mall, in the early 20s. And as he did that, he realized that to support retail shopping, uh, you need customers, obviously. So he began to build neighborhoods south and west of the plaza. And as he did that, he created mandatory homes associations, which had a good aspect to them in that they helped to make cohesive neighborhoods that were strong and still are. But the negative piece of that was that he began to require racially restrictive covenants within the deeds and these these would be perpetual. Uh, You could never sell to a black person. In some cases you could never sell to a Jewish person. And those were written into the deeds and I've read those deeds in the courthouse and they're sickening. And it wasn't until the uh, courts ruled such deeds unconstitutional and illegal that they lost their power to shape neighborhoods, but they certainly shaped Southwest Kansas City. That was Bill Timaeus, a longtime author and columnist for the Kansas City Star. His point is that this thing of beauty, this historic plaza modeled after Sevilla, Spain, has a dark side to it. During the winter holidays as a kid, I, like many, came here from the suburbs with my family to look at the infinite strings of Christmas lights lining every eve and window. Cinderella horse-drawn carriages lit with the same twinkling lights clopped next to cars, carrying wonderstruck couples. It was beautiful. But I had yet to understand the significance of these streets or the history that would continue to transpire between tightly packed facades. J.C. Nichols was a major player in the birth of the real estate industry. He was often president of, and always was influential in, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, NAREB, and through it, Nichols was influential in guiding the creation of, and the policy for, the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, and the Homeowners Loan Corporation, Hulk. What Nichols valued as good for business these new government agencies reinforced through official policy. White, racially homogeneous neighborhoods. In the summer of 2020, the buildings around you were boarded up amid fears of looting and destruction. Thousands of protesters gathered daily and decried the continuous brutality against people of color especially the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor by police, of Ahmaud Arbery by white supremacists. One tangible result that came from the protests, the removal of J.C. Nichols' name from what is now Mill Creek Parkway, formerly J.C. Nichols Parkway, as well as the removal of J.C. Nichols' name from the monumental fountain in Mill Creek Park, which you see to your left as we turn onto Brookside Boulevard. Nichols' descendants, as well as the charitable trust named for his son, voiced support for the change. Nichols' grandson, Mark Callison, was quoted in the Kansas City Star, saying, This is a defining moment for our city. Our family stands squarely behind the spirit of diversity, equality, and social justice that has taken hold in our region and in our nation. The street and fountain no longer honor J.C. Nichols but his racially restrictive covenants still persist in some house deeds. His racist practices have had big, long-term effects. But J.C. Nichols wasn't the only real estate developer in the country back then. To succeed, developers like him needed buyers. Sure, these racially restrictive covenants didn't actually impact the inherent value of these homes, They were still the same houses, same walls, same yards. But all those thousands of buyers surely would have looked elsewhere if they thought it was really a problem.
We're driving through another part of the city that was developed and then sold by J.C. Nichols. Just take a look at the houses on the right for a bit. Look at the style, the shape, the size. Of the houses you're passing, one or two are very recent builds, but a lot of them date from the 50s. Even more are from the original development in the 19 teens and 20s. You can mark these out easily by their foundations of large limestone blocks, front porches, and dormer windows that stick out from the roof. But even a 1950s home is an old home. Yet these days, a lot of people really want this older style of home. The houses you've been passing start around 300,000 and peak at over 800,000. This is a good neighborhood, and lots of people want to live here. Here's Sid again, the guy who lent his friend Harold $10,000 to flip a house and made quick profit. Well, Harold called him again. Pretty good interest on your money. And so uh, I said, Harold, you know, I trust you implicitly, but if it doesn't smell good, it just doesn't smell good. And the only thing making it smell a little better is because of you. But he called me again. He said, I have another house that you can do it. And I said, what's going on? And he says, well, I'm telling you, that's, this house is about 34th and Agnes or wherever. And I said, Harold, I've just got to use my own judgment. I want to go out and meet the people. And I'm going to tell them exactly what I'm doing with you, and I'm a lawyer, and I'm, there's going to be all... He says, okay, fine. Well, it happens to be that I met him out at this house, and a husband and a wife were there sitting, and I find out that he's the assistant water commissioner at the city hall. I'm not going to mention his name. It's not important now. And we had agreed, Harold and I, before we went, that 5000 was what I would offer. And I'm putting up the money. He's knowing exactly, and they're sitting there in the living room. And I said, do you realize what's happening here? Harold's going to, I'm going to lend him the money, and then he's going to go ahead and fix it up, and, and he's got his bills with him. And I told him, bring the bills. You can do the same thing, Mr. W. And he says, well, how much you give me for it? He says, I just got to get away from the niggers. And that's a quote, I hate that word, but that's what he said. This is Troost Avenue, the place that, historically, everyone tries to get away from. Welcome to the East Side, the Troost Divide. What many people, officials, organizations, and institutions consider the, quote, bad part of town. This area was built and developed at the same time as Brookside, but these homes start at $120,000 and peak at $200,000. Just a few blocks back, the most expensive homes cost three quarters of a million dollars. Troost is just a street, but it acts as the de facto line of division for white and black. This concludes chapter one of Dividing Lines. To continue the tour, go to chapter two on dividinglines.jocolibrary.org or start the next video in the YouTube playlist.